Good morning, everybody. Welcome to our Sunday service and especially a warm welcome if this is your first time with us. It's wonderful to have you worshipping online with us today. Let me tell you what's coming up in our service today. After our notices, uh, Steve Gray is going to bring us our Bible readings. Kathy Gray will be leading our prayers. I'm going to be preaching for us and linking everything together with our usual selection of hymns and songs, which I hope you'll enjoy. But first, here's what's happening this Sunday. Uh, as it's the fifth Sunday of the month, we're doing things a little differently. Uh, we've got a joint service for all of our churches coming together at Hanley Castle Church at 11 o'clock on Sunday morning. Then at 4 o'clock in Ripple Church, we've our annual service for the faithful departed, because of course Monday is All Saints Day. And at 5 p.m. in Upton, we've got our annual Bright Lights Party, which is a fun, family-friendly alternative to Halloween with the best game ever in Upton. It's always a blast anyway, so do come along to that if you've got children in the age, particularly sort of 3 through to 12. Then on Thursday, coming up this week, we've got a midweek communion service in Upton at 10 o'clock. And looking ahead to next weekend, we've got Breakfast Church back in Upton at half past nine. Uh, there's a service of Holy Communion in Hanley Swan at half past nine, followed by services at the Hook Church at 11 o'clock and Hanley Castle at half past six. Uh, for more information on our services and everything else that's going on, do have a look at our website, uh, hopechurchfamily.org forward slash calendar. You can also subscribe to our newsletter there and get a weekly update which will tell you everything that's going on directly. Now, in a moment, we're going to sing our opening song, but first let me point you in the direction of our collection. Many of you do already give regularly to our churches, and we're very, very grateful for that. But if you don't, or you would like to, uh, give a one-off gift or a regular gift even to help us through these tricky times then please do visit our online giving page hopechurchfamily.org forward slash giving where you can choose which of our parish churches you'd like to support and you'll find details also of our treasurers there contact them they can fill you in on any, any details you might lack thank you shall we quieten our hearts then and we're going to open ourselves up to meeting with God in worship so let's have a moment of quiet We say together, O Lord, open our lips, and our mouth shall proclaim your praise. Your faithful servants bless you. They make known the glory of your kingdom. Shall we pray? Blessed are you, sovereign God, ruler and judge of all. To you be praise and glory forever. In the darkness of this age that is passing away, may the light of your presence, which the saints enjoy, Surround our steps as we journey on. May we reflect your glory this day, and so be made ready to see your face in the heavenly city where night shall be no more. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Blessed be God forever. Well, let's turn that desire to bless the Lord into a song now, as we stand, if you wish, and we'll sing, Crown Him with Many Crowns.
well, do please take a seat. Brothers and sisters, the Holy Scripture calls us in various places to acknowledge and confess our many sins and wickedness, and that we shouldn't try to hide them before the face of Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, but confess them with a humble, lowly, penitent and obedient heart, so that we may obtain forgiveness of them by his infinite goodness and mercy. And although we ought at all times humbly to acknowledge our sins before God, we ought to do so especially when we assemble and come together to give thanks for the great blessings that we've received at his hands, to offer the praise that is due to him, to hear his most holy word and to ask him to supply our needs of body and soul. Therefore I ask and call you all to approach the throne of heavenly grace with me, humbly and with pure intent, saying, Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the evil intentions and desires of our own hearts. We have broken your holy laws. We have left undone what we ought to have done, and we have done what we ought not to have done, and thus there is no wholeness within us. Lord, have mercy on us, pitiful sinners. Spare those who confess their sins. Restore those who truly repent, even as you have promised through Jesus Christ our Lord. And grant, merciful Father, for his sake, that we may live hereafter a godly, righteous and holy life, to the glory of your holy name. Amen. And may Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon us, pardon and deliver us from all our sins, confirm and strengthen us in all goodness, and keep us in life eternal, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now here's Steve Gray with our first Bible reading. Our first reading is taken from the book of Revelation, chapter 21, beginning at verse 1. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. Those who are victorious will inherit all this, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters and all liars, they will be consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulphur. This is the second death. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks for reading that, Steve. Why don't we keep that reading in our mind because we're going to be coming back to it later. But let's cast our minds forward to the eternity that that reading described as we sing For All the Saints Who From Their Labours Rest. And why don't you stand for this one, if you wish. <laughs>
take a seat. So in a moment I'm going to be preaching for us, but here's Steve first with the second reading. Our reading is taken from the Gospel of John, chapter 11, beginning at verse 32. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? he asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, See how he loved him. But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there's a bad odour, for he has been there four days. Then Jesus said, Did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth round his face. Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes, let him go. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks for reading that. Shall we pray? Father God, we're going to fix our eyes on eternity now. We want to see what you have for us more clearly. So as we reflect on this passage from the book of Revelation, I pray that you would send your spirit into our hearts and minds that we might understand more clearly our destiny with you. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Someone said to me recently, I don't think I've ever heard a sermon about heaven. Well, I was a bit taken aback by that. I mean, we do talk about going to heaven, but actually we don't talk about the realities, the, what we know from the Bible of what heaven will be like. So I thought we'd try and do something about that today. Sometimes Christians can be a little bit vague about heaven. Now, sometimes that is because we're, we're focused on living in the here and now. But sometimes it's also because we're nervous about getting into some of the details and the challenges of what the Bible actually tells us that eternity or heaven is like. I'm going to try and address that today as I give you a bit of a, a rough guide to heaven. We're going to be using Revelation chapter 21 as our guidebook because it's the best account of what heaven will be like. Well, that and Revelation chapter 22. So do go and read those at your leisure later. But we're just going to focus particularly on those eight verses that were read to us earlier. And if you don't know the book of Revelation very well, it, it can be quite a strange book. It's, it's not written like a gospel or a, or a history book. It's a prophetic vision full of metaphor and Old Testament imagery and symbol. It was probably the last New Testament book written towards the end of the first century, most likely by the same John who wrote John's Gospel, who was probably the youngest of the disciples. And he received what he wrote as a vision from Jesus while he was in prison for preaching the gospel too much. Those nice tolerant Roman folk put him in prison for converting too many people. And Revelation ends by giving this vivid picture of God's great future for us. And I say great future quite intentionally because eternity is going to be extraordinary. It starts with the last judgment. Jesus returns and the world and all of our deeds are judged. And then God brings about the new heavens and the new earth where we'll live as new people and it's going to be wonderful so extraordinary we can never do it justice with words but we'll try so let me share four great encouragements from that passage from Revelation with you I don't expect you to remember all of them but the more you do then the more I hope you'll be encouraged and here's the first one eternity isn't clouds it's a new earth Ask most people to draw a picture of eternal life and they'll probably 
draw something that looks a bit like one of those old Philadelphia cheese adverts, all angels and clouds and harps. It's insubstantial, floaty, wafty. Personally, I don't find it a particularly attractive picture of what we're looking forward to. And that's good because it's not actually how the Bible tells us we're going to spend eternity either. We're not going to become floaty angels or insubstantial ghosts. We're not going to float around in a cloudy room. Instead, we get real physical bodies. Jesus was the firstborn from the dead and our resurrection bodies will be patterned after his resurrection body. And we get to live somewhere real and physical too. The new earth. Think how our reading began. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. The first earth that that reading was talking about is this one where we live now, for all its broken loveliness. We know it is broken, don't we? God made us to take care of it, to be its stewards, and the human race has not done a great job of it, have we? That's what all this COP26 climate summit stuff is about this coming week. We're trying to fix what's broken, and that's really, really important that we try. But it shouldn't blind us to God's promise that one day this first earth will pass away. Maybe it'll be soon. Maybe it'll be hundreds or thousands of years away. We simply don't know. It'll happen when God wants it to happen. And when he does, he'll do what Revelation tells us he's going to do. He's going to make it new. And that new earth will be where we spend our eternity. A new Eden, a real physical world, beautiful beyond imagining. Trees, rivers, forests, gardens, mountains, the best of the old will be in the new. So if you've ever fancied learning to ski or scuba dive, this is going to be your big chat and you'll have an eternity to practice it. And if your balance when it comes to skiing is anything like as bad as mine, you'll probably need an eternity to master it. Elsewhere in the Bible, the prophet Isaiah talks about the new earth in terms of us building houses and dwelling in them, planting vineyards to eat their fruit. So we're going to be builders and farmers, and I dare say we'll have other jobs as well, though there'll be no life insurance salesman. The new earth will be all that's good in this world, but better. Or, or maybe another way to think about it is that the world we know and love now is but a dull, shadowy version of the world to come. As St Paul puts it in 1 Corinthians 13, now we see in the mirror dimly, then we shall know in full. So there's our first encouragement. Eternity isn't clouds, but a real physical earth and real physical bodies. Here's the second encouragement. In eternity, we won't sin. What was it John saw? He saw a new heaven and a new earth and there was no longer any sea. Now, I don't know how that leaves you feeling. Having grown up in a coastal city, Sunderland, I'm quite fond of the sea myself. But to a first century Jew, the sea was a place of chaos, of evil, of opposition to God. So when John says sea here, he's not so much talking about the physical body of water floating around at the end of Western Pier. He means chaos. He means opposition to God. And that won't happen in the new creation. If we'd had time to read chapter 20 of the Revelation, we'd know why, because we'd have read about the last judgment and the destruction of all of God's enemies. The point is that all the bad stuff stops at the judgment of the world. In the new creation, evil simply won't be there anymore. That's why John can go on to say, Then I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. Believe it or not, that city represents us, the saints, God's people. And did you notice how he describes us? Holy, beautifully dressed as a bride, ready for her husband. Question, do you feel holy now? I mean, when you're being honest with yourself. You see, for me, this is actually the hardest thing to grasp about eternity. Knowing what I'm like now, I struggle to understand how... I can be there in eternity one day and yet not ruin the perfection of it by doing things wrong. How could that title holy ever be used of somebody like me? So much of my inner thought life now is, is a minute to minute battle in my heart and mind and soul about the fight against temptation to do wrong. It's so much part of my day to day experience it's hard to imagine anything else. I suspect the same may be true of you too. I mean, even with the Holy Spirit's help, being a faithful Christian isn't easy. 
And yet, wonderfully, this passage is promising that a time is coming when we won't have that fight anymore. Uh, a time is coming when all those parts of our personalities that are broken and lead us into endless mischief will work properly. We'll sit at the finest banquets with the best food ever and we won't act like gluttons. We'll drink the finest wines but not overindulge. We'll hang out with people we can't stand now and we'll love them like Jesus did. How can it be like this? Well, as always, the answer is Jesus. The perfect life he lived among us is a preview of the life we'll all live in eternity. A life which we can only receive because Jesus was willing to come into our world and take all of our failure and sin onto himself at the cross and let it die with him before rising from death to bring us the new life that we experience in part now, but one day in eternity we'll experience in full. A life where everything will be allowed, but we won't sin. So let's praise God, because in eternity, we're not going to sin anymore. And that's great. Here's the third encouragement. In eternity, God will be with us. So God's made the world new. There's no more sea, and the people of God are there, and they're holy and perfect. What happens next? I heard a loud voice, says John, from the throne, saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. God is going to be there in the new earth with us. What's the hardest thing about living the Christian life now? Isn't it that we worship a God we can't see, feel, smell, touch? But one day we'll be like Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden again, walking and talking with our Heavenly Father in this beautiful garden city that will be the New Jerusalem. Think about what that means. God will no longer feel distant. All the times we've wanted answers to questions, they're coming to an end. All those times we've tried to find satisfaction and joy in things other than God, well, they're coming to an end because God will be there with us to satisfy all our longings and all our needs fully. In eternity, he will be with us. Final encouragement. In eternity, there's no more suffering. My best friend died suddenly when I was 22, and I, I can still remember the day very, very clearly. The phone call, the shock, the horror of having to ring many, many of my friends and tell them that Paul had died, and then to go to his room at college and help clear it out. It was an awful experience. I still miss and grieve for my friend, even though I know he was a Christian, and that I'll get to see him again. And... Like me, I guess many of you have been carrying grief like that around for years. At times it can feel like a bit of a dead weight strapped to your back. Well, when God comes to dwell among us in the new creation, he promises to lift that burden, to set us free by wiping every tear from our eyes. There'll be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. Imagine that. All the worst of this world, the death, the pain, the suffering, disease, sickness, the old order of things, the order we know and live in now, that's going to pass away and be replaced by perfection. No more death, no more grieving, no more tears, no more sadness. We'll live forever with no pain, no disease, no disability, no stain of bitterness, spite or evil, and surrounded by incredible beauty and a vast array of people who will love us and be lovely to us. It's going to be amazing, and it's going to last forever and ever and ever, and get better and better and better. That's God's ultimate answer to the pain and suffering of this life. Freedom, peace, beauty, and joy forever. I hope you find that enticing. I hope you find it like cool, clear water on a hot, sunny day. And that's why God invites us to come and quench our thirst in him, saying, verse 6, To the thirsty I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. Those who are victorious will inherit all this, and I will be their God and they will be my children. So to finish, let me ask the obvious question. Do you want to inherit all this? All that I've been describing, this beautiful, 
wonderful eternity because it isn't automatic. There are people in the church today who tell you everybody goes to heaven. Well, they should read a passage like this and see that God is offering us a choice. If everybody goes, why does God keep offering us choices? It makes no sense of the Bible. God offers the water of life to us. Will you drink it? And will you go on choosing to drink it? Because that's what victory means in this passage. It's not just a, a one-off choice made many years ago to turn to Jesus. It's a lifelong choice to keep on quenching our spiritual thirst in him. That's the choice that grim verse at the end of our reading sets before us. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters and all liars, they will be consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulphur. This is the second death. God says all that to give us a choice, to find eternal life by quenching our spiritual thirst with Jesus, or face the lake of fire by trying to quench our spiritual thirst somewhere else. You see, how we quench our spiritual thirst has consequences for our eternity. So on this All Saints Day, let me invite you, the saints, to quench your thirst with Jesus, to find your hope and joy and satisfaction in him alone. And if that hasn't been your walk of late, if you've slipped, fallen, allowed yourself to be distracted from him, then please know that there is good news. There is a way back. This whole passage is written not to condemn your weakness, but to encourage and remind you that Jesus came into the world to rescue people just like you. And he stands at the door of your life knocking, inviting you to open it and welcome him in. And as we welcome him in, he also welcomes us into his wonderful new creation, our true home, the home we've been yearning for all our lives. I hope you want to go there. Let's pray. Father God, for the future we have, I give you thanks and praise. And I pray for anyone listening in today who doesn't know you, that they might choose your beautiful eternity, that they might not be deceived by the folly of songs that say they'd rather laugh with the sinners than die with the saints, but turn instead to you, knowing that what you promise is much, much better than any alternative. Build your church, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I mentioned at the start of the sermon that sometimes Christians don't talk about eternity enough. And if we don't talk about it, you can bet we don't sing many songs about it either. But here's one that attempts to give the big picture of God's amazing work from the beginning to the end and celebrate just how beautiful it is. It's called You're Beautiful, and you may just want to stay seated for this one and let the words and the lyrics wash over you. And you can join in with the chorus when you're ready if you want.
Why don't we stand? We're going to declare our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Well, why don't you all take a seat now? And here's Cathy Gray to lead us in prayer. Father, we thank you for your goodness and unfailing mercy to us, for all your blessings and for your great love which passes understanding. You have called us to cast all our cares upon you because you care for us, so we thank you that we can come to you as, our, as your beloved children and bring all our needs and concerns before you, knowing that you will hear and answer our prayers. Let us pray this morning for all who work through the power of Christ in the church today. Bless our Archbishops Justin and Stephen, Bishops John and Martin, Mark, Maria and the Deanery team, and Barry and all our local ministry teams. Uphold them and encourage them in all they do. Let us pray for all your people, that we may seek first the Kingdom of God, that all Christian churches may grow together in unity of faith, and witness to your gospel of love. Help us in whatever way we can to serve the needs of the poor and disadvantaged, heal the wounds of injustice, and counter the division and materialism in our society. And let us remember our brothers and sisters who suffer persecution for their faith, especially Sony in Nepal, and for the remnant church in Afghanistan. Grant them the blessings of your Holy Spirit, Help them to find strength and peace in you and bring them safely through their troubles. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us pray for all governments and authorities, for our Queen and all who govern in her name. Grant them wisdom, discernment and right judgment so that the people will be able to flourish in a society where all are cared for and valued. Let us pray for those seeking to bring peace and reconciliation where there is conflict and division, remembering especially Syria, Israel, Palestine, Sudan and Ukraine. And let us pray for the dreadful situation in Afghanistan, that you will bring help to those in such desperate need and the establishment of righteous and compassionate government. Let us pray for the COP26 meeting in Glasgow beginning on Sunday. Open the hearts of the world's leaders to work together with renewed vigour to make the changes needed to tackle climate change and to help repair the damage that we've done to your beautiful world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And let us pray for our local community especially our schools, that the children, staff and parents will be blessed with a good half-term break and safe travelling. We pray for the elderly and the lonely among us, that they may receive comfort, companionship and care from those around them. And we pray for all those who provide essential services within our community, our GP and dental surgeries, fire, police and ambulance services, care home staff and other carers, food banks and so many more, Bless them and uphold them, Lord, in all they do. And we ask you to bless our, all our church activities as we seek to be salt and light in our communities. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us pray for those who are sick or suffering, 
for those recovering from illness and any in special need. For Melanie Wood, Ruth Groom, Margaret Lithgow, Hazel Parsons, Rennie Dowson, Robert England, Simon Barclay, Mary Purser, Catherine Griffin, Julian Hart, Pam Morton, Jean Trevor Morgan, Jennifer Unwin, Betty and any others known to us. Grant them your peace, healing and restoration. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And we pray for the souls of all those whom we've loved but now have gone beyond the veil of this mortal life. May their souls and the souls of all the faithful departed rest in peace and rise in glory. And let us pray for the recently bereaved families and friends of Alan Godby, June Walcott, Betty Yap, John Overton, Brian Green, Harry Civil, and anyone who has been recently bereaved. May they know your peace, healing and restoration, being assured of your great love for each one of us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And so, trusting in your never-failing mercies, we pray that the strength of God will sustain us, the power of God preserve us, the hands of God protect us, the way of God direct us, and the love of God fill our hearts. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thanks for those prayers, Cathy. And why don't we continue in prayer as we pray the Church's special prayer for this week. Almighty God, you have knit together your elect in one communion and fellowship in the mystical body of your Son, Christ our Lord. Grant us grace so to follow your blessed saints in all virtuous and godly living, that we may come to those inexpressible joys that you have prepared for those who truly love you. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And uniting our prayers with the whole company of heaven, as our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Well, before we sing our final hymn, I'd like to share a little musical reflection with you from Jonathan Kimber, who is our Diocesan Director of Ministry and Discipleship. Hello. I began piano lessons aged six with an elderly lady who kept a 12-inch ruler by the piano. Any wrong notes? Yes, you've guessed it. Tap on the knuckles. So what do you think my teacher would have done if I had played this chord and then added on top this note? I think you're right. A tap on the knuckles would have followed. But I've begun dabbling in jazz recently, and it offers, a, it offers a perspective on wrong notes rather different to that of my piano teacher. Essentially, in jazz, there's no such thing as a wrong note. Why is that? Well, as a good player improvises a melody, their finger may land on something that sounds wrong, but they stay relaxed because they know that from any point, there are always a dozen good ways forward. So this note, this note can be followed by these. There was tension, which creates momentum and leads to resolution. There's energy, there's forward movement. Now clearly, in life, some things are definitely wrong and we must be very careful to avoid them. But I wonder whether some of us have been formed too much by the spirit of my piano teacher. In our desire to avoid mistakes, do we sometimes lose sight of the life and love of God? In our desire to avoid a rap on the knuckle, have we been cut off from God's joy and freedom, avoiding even relatively minor risks? It can be true for us as individuals and also as churches. 
discerning our next notes against the current background music of life. Jazz musicians immerse themselves in the jazz tradition, absorbing into their bloodstream the notes and rhythms of jazz. May we similarly immerse ourselves in the God and in the Christian tradition, and may we then seek to join in the creative energy always flowing from the heart of God. As we trust that there will always be good ways forward, may we discover more fully and invite others to join the glorious liberty of the children of God. Well, thanks for that, Jonathan. To finish our time together this morning, we're going to sing a great Charles Wesley hymn that leads our eyes back towards eternity. Love divine, all loves excelling. And why don't you stand for this if you wish?
do take a seat. Thanks for joining us in worship today. Please invite others to join us as we worship online week by week. And if this is your first time worshipping with us, I hope it's been a good experience for you. We'll be here same time next week. We're also meeting in person in our churches now. We're able to sing together at last, which is wonderful. And I'm particularly looking forward to this weekend where we'll have a larger gathering in Handley Castle and a larger song. So if you feel ready to return, do come and add your voice to the chorus. And if there's any way we can help you in your spiritual journey during these strange times, do get in touch with me, barry at hopechurchfamily.org. And so, may Christ, who has opened the kingdom of heaven, bring us to reign with him in glory. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Shall we finish with the words of the grace? <laughs> may the grace, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. And the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, and the Lord. Amen.